Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, my name is Vinod Chandramali. I will be your moderator for today's event. Um, once again, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this lovely Saturday morning. Uh, we're really hoping uh, that you're able to take some takeaways back from this event. Um, I was chatting with a few of you uh, right before this event, and uh, one of the obvious answers for what made you come here was Pranay and Aruna. Uh, but another one was also curiosity. A lot of you came here because you were curious to know what this topic is all about, what this event is all about. Uh, I think curiosity is also a great word to describe what got Abhishek, Nishant and I to build mycelium ecology. Um, as humans collectively cross the 8 billion milestone, many fear that we are starting to see an increase in the human wildlife conflict emerging from successful conservation methods, in many cases unsuccessful as well, which also leads to abundance of protected wildlife. And often we don't know what to do uh, when we have to ask the question, could we really coexist? When the three of us met to ideate around this, we realized that although each of us came with our own yardstick for success, our goals perfectly aligned. We wanted to build a community that observes, interprets, and nurtures the world we live in. We wanted to design a playbook that contributes to the idea of conservation through coexistence. And we also wanted to create a medium for next generation to appreciate and value nature around them. At Mycelium Ecology, we are investing in our children's future by owning and conserving rapidly depleting biodiverse habitats across Western Ghats. Our approach is to create knowledge, conversations, spaces and installations for the future generation to reflect. Understanding our backyard is our first step into gathering this community and is aimed at creating dialogues that simplify our relationship with nature. The same sense of curiosity which got us mycelium ecology, which got us, which got all of you here, also made us reach out to our panel members today. And uh, they wholeheartedly welcomed us into their uh, community. So we are very uh, thankful and grateful for that. When I spoke to Aruna uh, for the first time, I quickly realized the steep learning curve I had in front of me. Aruna, who is an alumnus of Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, has more than 30 years of varied entrepreneurial and senior management experience in the food, agriculture, and retail industry. Since 2013, she's been developing organizational capabilities for Indian Foundation for Humanistic Development, IFHD, and Sneha Kunj Trust. Aruna has designed and implemented impactful programs in biodiversity conservation, sustainable consumption and production, greening economies, to name a few. Now you know why the steep learning curve. I've got to moderate Aruna in. But please join me in welcoming Aruna Rangachar Pol on stage. In my previous life, I used to be heading sales. Reaching out to an acclaimed author over a LinkedIn email is by far the most salesperson thing I'd ever done. To our surprise, Pranay actually agreed, responded to the message, and was even kind enough to take time off his busy schedule to hear our story. Pranay Lal's first book, Indica, A Deep Natural History of the Indian Subcontinent, blends India's geological history with its ecological past through the skillful use of fossil records tracing the formation of the subcontinent in the process. It's been recognized as the first compelling narrative of India's deep natural history by the Hindu, and I completely agree with it. If his first book defies categorization, his second book, Invisible Empire, The Natural History of Viruses, brings together science, history, and great storytelling to paint a fascinating picture of viruses as a major actor not just in human civilization, but also in the human body. So it's my absolute honor to welcome Pranay Lal on stage. Pranay, welcome. All right, um, so that's the first stage, and then this is the second, and then we move here. But I thought I'll begin by introducing one of the characters from our story. Okay. So this enigmatic looking amphibian 
uh, is called the Indian purple frog. The discovery of Indian purple frog or pig nose frog in 2003 is considered within the scientific community to be a significant find. This enigmatic amphibian found exclusively in the Western Ghats of India, especially only in the southern parts of Western Ghats. Why is it significant? Living under the ground throughout its life and emerging out onto the ground for a very short period, perhaps few days or few weeks in the entire year, their ancient lineage has evolved independently for about 120 million years. Here are a few events they witnessed and survived as well. Forming of new continents, wipeout of the great dinosaurs, evolution of mammals, ice age, and finally us humans becoming the dominant species. No wonder it looks like this. It's gone through a lot. Their closest relatives are found in Seychelles Islands, which makes it even more significant and serves as an important piece of biological evidence supporting the existence of the supercontinent Gondwana. Sprenai, let's start with you. I wanted to bring this up because your narrative about them in your book is a treat to read. Uh, I know you've gone great lengths in seeing it uh, breed, holding it. Uh, walk us through the formation of Western Ghats, maybe through the story of uh, uh, the Indian purple frog. Uh, thank you, Vinod. I think it uh, couldn't be a better peg to begin with because, uh, you know, you're right. Uh, this odd-looking creature has perhaps witnessed uh, so many tumultuous events um, not just geological, but evolutionary as well. So the time when this creature was living, there were no flowering plants, right? I mean, when it evolved about 140 million years ago, there were no flowering plants. I mean, they would have been ancestors of the early flowering plants, uh, as in the angiosperm plants, but they were too minuscule or too, too, uh, too uh, formidable to make, uh, or not too formidable to make any impact on the ecology. So the gymnosperms dominated the forest. And the forests where they're found now are completely changed. They're largely dominated by the angiosperms. There's few uh, gymnosperms that you find in the forests of the Nilgiri now. So that's one major faunal change that they've seen, which I think is very important because you see that change happening in the fossil record. In terms of the geological events that happened was that the critical one is the separation of India with Madagascar. And I think that's the real story that uh, needs to be told and you know really cherished in some ways. Uh, let's start with the, with the very beginning. Let's start at say about 720 million years ago when you know, India and Antarctica and Africa and Madagascar, all of us were cleaved together. And it was for about 500 million years that there was very little perturbation in terms of tectonic movement and these Gondwanan islands, the southern islands, uh, were welded together. And slowly, this, there were cracks that were beginning to form. And so Antarctica first started to pair off from South America and southern tip of Africa, you know, the first event that happened. But it was not a clear-cut separation. There were still uh, sutures that were joining these land masses together. But a series of these fireworks, if you were to imagine this and you were, if you were to play the tectonic uh, tape, if I could say that, the, 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 a videotape of how uh, separations happened and there were massive, massive volcanic activity that happened from under the sea that you know, shifted continents in a, in, a, in a very large way. And it was between 120 million years and 88 million years that the story of this amphibian comes into play. Now, what is very, very incredible about this creature is that the southern tip of Madagascar, India, Antarctica were perhaps the point of origin of all the modern amphibians. So there was this constant exchange that was happening from these land masses into Africa. Africa had just separated slightly from Madagascar, but it was still a saline water body. And as we know, most amphibians, or large, largely currently most amphibians, do not tolerate salt water well. 
So it would have been a massive challenge for amphibians like this creature to have crossed over. So how would they do it? They would cross over into a new continent or a landmass through rock, rafts, or you know, there would be a, a tree or a, or, a, or a log that is floating, and you would have a couple of creatures hanging on. So think about a, a tree getting washed in a flood, a tropical flood from, say, Kerala, or, or South Kanara, or, or say, Narmada, and it's getting washed down the sea, and it lands on the eastern coast of, uh, of, of Africa or one of the Indian Ocean islands, and that's where they find their new footing and evolve in a different way. Now, the geneticists want to understand that what creature created the next creature, what life form led to the formation of the next life form. So that's the interesting story that genetics tells us. But it's also geology that tells you that story because you need to now look at the tectonic events that actually caused the creation of these land masses. And how genetics informs us about the creation of these life forms. So it's a fascinating story. It's something that's evolving because we, are, we keep finding very, very interesting species of frogs and other amphibians as well in the Western Ghats. And the same is happening in Indian Ocean and in Eastern, Eastern East Coast of Africa and also South America because the hopping process did not end just with Africa. I mean, the process continued. We're talking of millions of years, right? Uh, and a million years in evolutionary scale is pretty significant. Just to let you know, I mean, just, just to give you a sense of what I, what I mean about a million years. Imagine that most of the songbirds that you see outside, you know, uh, whichever bird that you've heard just now this morning, chances are that they've emerged somewhere between 22,000 to 9,000 years ago. So most of the birds that we see today, the modern birds, uh, are actually a creation of the last great ice age. So it's, it, it's an incredible thing because our earliest ancestors, you know, uh, people who left uh, Africa would have encountered different kinds of birds. They would have not seen the bulbul. I mean, perhaps they would have seen a bulbul, but it would have been slightly different. So in the, the, the point I'm making here is that the frogs too have had a series of uh, isolations and uh, and events in which they met again, and that communion uh, and and the opportunity of genes mixing again is an incredible one. Uh, and I think uh, we still do not have a full picture of how different amphibians or even birds or any other creature have actually come to be the way they are in a, in a full sense. So that full circle, we we have some fuzzy or a hazy understanding of how species got here, but the understanding is only going to get better resolution with uh, understanding species and other relatives and cousins and cousins far removed in a, in a genetic and a geological sense. I don't know if I've rambled to on, but... Uh, no, 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 it's a great... Uh, uh, I, I love the fact that the songbirds are just after the Ice Age. Does that mean that prior to it, the world was a lot more quieter or was it a crass sound and it's more beautiful now? We, we, we would never know because I think, uh, you know, if again, I mean, um, if you were to talk to an anatomist yeah. uh, and you were to show them the throat and the, and the bill structure, they would be able to predict that this bird was a, uh, was a, had a shrill call or had a, uh, had a soothing call. You know, they would be able to say something about it. Sure. So, uh, but again, we can't be very, very sure about it, yeah. things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, you touched upon uh, the fact that we are, evolving our understanding on, on each of these, including our understanding on Western Ghats. Um, and in your book, you often write about uh, this whole notion of everything together. You're multiple places, you're the big picture guy. Um, what does big picture tell us about understanding uh, ecolo Indian ecological history? How mature is our understanding towards it? And especially with places like Western Ghats and the Sundarbans and the Himalaya regions, we've got a lot of hotspots yeah. uh, in India. Yeah. How ecologically uh, significant is this? How much do we know about it? So in terms of geology, um, you know, so let, let me step back a bit. And let me say this, that, you know, just like uh, 
the number of species of mammals we have on earth is the exact number is of rocks that we have classified so you know so rocks and minerals are also species because they are things that have evolved alongside not just the uh, the violent nature of the earth of uh, you know minerals mixing and colliding and heated and put under pressure underwater or oxygenating themselves but there is also the action of microbes that create minerals so there are several minerals uh, for example agate agate is a mineral that is largely created by the action of underwater oxygen production in depleted um, oxygen conditions where some life form emerges and creates a silicaceous body and that's what leads to the creation of agate right uh, there can be other reasons for creation of ag agates also but one of the main reasons of opals and 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 agate is is uh, the biological force so you have minerals creating microbes and and life forms and life forms creating minerals so that interaction is fascinating and i think that's something that we, we don't appreciate much the second thing that i think is incredible about western guards is that you know we see it as a linear you know a chain uh, but you know it's taken us uh, several I mean, each fragment of of the western guards has been created at different times and at, in different processes sometimes it's collision sometimes it's compression sometimes it's subduction subduction means when the mountainous region or 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 a plane that just subsides suddenly i mean just because the movement of landforms is such that just collapses so i mean one of the recent discoveries uh, which i think i must tell and i was talking to rohit outside that you know I, I, you know my book begins with nandi hills being the oldest part of india well actually you know it's now wrong <laughs> we found a older rock than that and it's also in the you know it's in this belt but it's in the western ghats closer to the western ghats not the 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 western ghats it's near kurk and you know there's this isolated hill which is about 4.1 billion years old so it actually pushes the age by about 400 million years so we had imagined that the oldest rock in peninsula india was about 3.6 3.7 but you when you when you come to about 4.1 billion years you're talking you know so close to the origin of the earth because earth originated 4.567 you know it's a lovely number to remember earth emerged in in its current form 4.567 billion years ago right and if this rock is 4.1 billion years old uh, so it's basically you know 450 uh, million years younger i mean the earth had only just formed and the rocks were still forming so i think that story is fascinating that if you know i think you know i have been pleading to the two governments the state government of of, uh, of tamil nadu and uh, and the central government that this isolated hill needs to be protected perhaps is the now the oldest province rock province uh, in the world you know it, it actually competes with the others so should it not have protection right of course there it is it is under protection i mean it's got uh, you know it's under forest and all that so i think i'm digressing but let me just come to the story of the western ghats so western ghats like i said is not a single let's not look at it uh, look at it as a as a monolith it's it's a it's amazing amount of diversity even in terms of rocks so you've got uh, if you start from the southern tip if you start from nagar coil if you if that's the beginning of the western ghats because there's no clear definition of where western ghats begin or end in terms of geology or biodiversity i think it's a very fuzzy area but for me uh, if i were to look at rocks i would say it starts at nagar coil and ends at somewhere near the dangs you know somewhere in southern dangs in in gujarat and that's to me is western ghats um, i mean we can debate this i think a lot of geologists and paleontologists and uh, ecologists would differ i mean but that's something that uh, you know because it's taken so many billion years in the making there can be no easy answer but let's say that we start from nagar coil you've got Uh, for about 80 kilometers till you reach uh, trivandrum you've got a single uh, you know granitic zone which is unique i mean it's it's amazing the only other replicable rock uh, is in antarctica just move a little north it's very different you come till achankovil river in uh, in kerala it's it's a different type of a of a granitoid rock right and and just keep going on till you hit the deccan basalt which again is is a is a layer that has formed over the granitic province and if you reach as soon as you come to say goa you come to the 
wonderful lateritic rock. You know, it's this beautiful red porous rock which got heated from below, and uh, it's it's got this uh, very skeleton looking. It looks like a dried up coral. Uh, just leave uh, Savantwadi and uh, to up to Ratnagiri. Just move north, and you come to again to the uh, to the the Deccan basalt, which is again very fascinating. It's a different kind of basalt. Uh, again. Travel north of uh, Narmada, you the basalt province ends for a short time. You reach a large alluvial fan uh, till the dance, and you've got a different kind of a forest. The forest between Balsard, uh, Valsard and Navsari, and you know up to uh, say the southern dance is completely different. You know the the forest type is different. In fact, the dominant trees are different. The fossil types are different. I mean the the pollen structure that we find in soils packed. Uh, so what? Uh, Paleontologists do in the absence of uh, large fossils. They look for one of the most enduring thing, one of the hardiest things that you can find in nature, and that's pollen. Pollen does not get destroyed unless it is burnt. Uh, it just doesn't destroy because it's made out of uh, siliceous, uh, uh, silica-rich compounds. And silica is very difficult to destroy. So if you really want to understand a forest of the past, you look at the soil, analyze the the pollen structure, and you would know what kinds of grasses or large trees and other things would have lived in, in deep time. So you would be able to recreate, at least reimagine the kind of forest that would have existed in, in those times. So I think that's fascinating. And I think if you were to actually do a paleo forest thing that, you know, how was a forest 100 years ago in, say, Kerala versus, say, southern Karnataka versus, uh, you know, other parts of the, of the Western Ghats, you would have a different uh, forest type, entirely for different forest type. So, you know, the big myth, or, the, or rather the misconception, uh, which I'm trying to fight is that all rocks are similar, they look the same, right? Or, or they are, you know, all forests are similar, even if the dominant trees may be different, but the rest of the forest is the same. I don't think that's true, because the ecological services and the biodiversity and the biodiversity services that come with the forest and the forest community is, is incredibly different and diverse and you know, and hence the services are very different. So I would, you know, really urge uh, mycelium and other groups that are working on conservation to bring this nuanced understanding that not all forests along the Western Ghats, or even within, you know, a few kilometers, they are very, very different. So all of it needs to be protected now. Yeah, uh, and you're right, very right when you say that uh, as soon as you enter a forest, it looks very um, similar. And people often say that I'm losing out. But when you are in there, you very clearly know it's not the same. It's two different dangerous sections of the same forest, but it's very different. Um, in your book, uh, and also uh, in the uh, newer book of the micro world, you are always on the history part. You're always looking through the past uh, to see if you can find answers. So why understanding ecological history matters today? And how can it help? Uh, wh what do we know so far? And how can it help today's generation to um, make it better or make the earth better? Um, it's a very difficult question. I think this is, a, uh, you know, I think you need a three-day conference to actually discuss this. I think all of them would be OK in staying back <laughs> for three days for this, no problem. So, you know, just to give you an example, I was just trying to, you know, when you were posing this question to me, I was kind of uh, not sure how to answer this because I don't think what the previous generation knew about, say, even uh, things like, say, climate change or even, I mean, let me ask you this question. What, according to you, is the biggest photosynthesizer in the world? Everybody would say trees, right? Algae, great. You're getting closer, but it's not even algae. It's it's another kind of a micro. But yeah, you're close. But you know, so yeah, it's planktons and you know that microbial community in the top 80 meters of the oceans and seas and lakes. You know that's and you know it took us till about 1995, 96 when the first papers started to say that the biggest carbon barriers and the largest oxygen producers are not trees. You know. So we really do not understand our environmental systems. And if you were to look at the current debates that are happening on climate change, for example, uh, we are heavily invested in planting trees. I love trees. Please don't get me wrong. I love trees. I love uh, grasses. I love lichen, all of them. 
But you know, spare a thought that, the f- that we need to be conserving deep lakes, rivers, even salt pans, you know. Uh, salt pans are essential for sulfur cycle. Deserts are important to keep evergreen forests alive. You know, this is, a, this is something that dawned in, I think, 2004, 2005. NASA was looking at pictures of a big dust storm moving west into Azores from the Sahara, westwards into the, to Canary Islands, Azores, into Brazil and, and Central America. And there they found that the amount, the, the amount of sand that gets carried from the Sahara is so much and so incredible and so important because it fertilizes the evergreen forests. The evergreen forests, because they have so much humic uh, acid, because there's such a large amount of litter that falls, and there's a huge amount of precipitation. So there's water flowing through the Amazon. In fact, the Amazon, parts of the Amazon sink during the monsoon, the, the South American monsoon, right? I mean, there's a there's a there's an entire flooding that happens. But how does the Amazon get its nourishment, its nutrients? It comes partly from the Sahara. So the corals of the Caribbean actually depend the the, phos- the phosphate and the phosphorus content, the iron content comes from Sahara, right? There is no iron in in all of the Caribbean islands or even in the, uh, you know, there is some iron in, in, in Mexico, but it doesn't leach into the Caribbean Sea. So think about it, that, you know, all these interlinked things that we find, we classify deserts and semi-arid areas as wastelands. I think, I think we make a major, major mistake when we do that, you know. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question. I'm just digressing. But the point I'm making <laughs> here is uh, that uh, how much do we know? I don't think we know anything. We only have basic understanding of how the systems perhaps are interconnected. We don't even know the utility function, as uh, Richard Dawkins says. You know, what is God's utility function for a species? You know, a single species vanishes, a tree a species get extinct. And along with the tree and the bird, there are other microbes that depended on them also die. So what is the question? But the question is now, a larger question is that how does that play out in the long term? Although that piece, that that small community has got extinct in a larger forest, the extinction of the dodo, we now realize that about 18 other trees and plant species died out because of the dodo not consuming the fruits and the seeds of those uh, those plants, right? So it is not just that a uh, dumb bird, you know, which could not fly and was easy meat, got extinct. There were several other things. And now, perhaps in the future, we're going to discover even more. When it comes to microbes and fungi and, and lichen that depended on the dodo's droppings or, or anything else, we don't know, right? So the question is, let us all be very humble as we start to relish and love and nurture the forest that, you know, there is so much that nature has to teach us. And, you know, uh, it's not just the basic sciences. We might have cracked the, the genome and the genetic code and all of that. But how does it play out in the real world and how does that all interact? It's something which is incredible. You will, we will take generations before we start to say that, I think we now understand this ecosystem. I think, I don't know, I don't think I answer your question. No, 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 you did. And uh, Great Migration of Sands is a, is a great book you could uh, add next. Um, but it's, it's fascinating to know that uh, um, we don't consider activity of migration. It's very uh, lively and, you know, things like sand migrating all the way in whatever format, it still is, I, would you say it's a migration? Or would you say it's just the way it works? And if the if the climate doesn't have, I mean, let's assume that the impact of climate is there. Does that mean there's a whole new world of extinction we could see coming? If it stops migrating all the way to the Canary Island? Well, I think it, there's going to be a significant change Got it. Uh, in the... The, the community, the plant community, and, and, and the creatures that depend on the sand, you know, the, the first uh, digesters of the sands are going to depend on it. Uh, and therefore, the larger trees and others who depend on the phosphorus, potassium, and the iron that comes from those sands. I think that's critical. Uh, you know, while you were asking the question, my, 
my mind was racing into another issue and and that was to ask that question uh, you know do we know enough in terms of how much we need to manipulate nature in mm. order to understand mm. what's going to be the larger impact of it for example i'm quite not happy with the green shields that africa is making uh, i know that the desert is spreading i have I've, i grew up in africa north africa so i know uh, the desert i could say that i i know it rather well uh, it is a bleak place but it's also so lively it's it's an amazing part of the world if the natural processes are such that the desert has to expand uh, there's got to be forest that will grow in other parts because mm. that nourishment from the wind systems will get carried mm. away to a new place it would either create new coral or it will create a new rain forest or a deciduous forest um, the same thing is true for kerala i mean it's not just i mean the story about the sahara desert reaching uh, amazon is not the only one we know that the desert uh, uh, dust that comes from it's the horn of africa and from eastern sahara and the saudi arabian peninsula comes to kerala and goes across uh, as far as the dangs so well, i mean so the nourishment is it's a mutual process you know there's a symbiotic process happening across the oceans right yeah. so yeah i i i i don't have a clear answer on this i think uh, you know perhaps uh, like i said it's going to take uh, several centuries before we actually can understand the larger systems at play uh, um, on migration sorry there's another point a creature that migrates uh, the most compared to its body length is uh, our microbes in the oceans because they rise and fall every night you know they come up in the early uh, you know when the sun comes out they they come from the bottom of the ocean or closer to the bottom of the ocean rise up and descend again so you know that cycle of uh, plankton and other you know microscopic creatures uh who live longer than a day because most microscopic creatures in the oceans live only a day maximum a week a few live a few months but you know those creatures that go with the churning you know it's with the temperature and the sunlight which is driving their migration day in and day out that's an incredible migration that we don't talk about mm. we love to talk about the Ar- arctic turn the uh, the dragonflies that move from africa to india to central india uh those are fascinating stories i mean let's not discount that but you know i think the more humble creatures are the ones we don't celebrate yeah right yeah great um i don't know our focus now moves to you on uh, chapter 1 we sort of uh, heard pranay uh, we looked at uh, how to observe western ghats and i'm going to come back to you pranay with a bunch of more questions but uh, i'm sort of breaking this as chapter 2 which is uh, all about interpretation um i can't think of any example of positive interpretation of nature other than our tribal communities and you work with a lot of them in western ghats they've been practicing conservation through coexistence for a long long time they were kadus or sacred groves sacred ponds and stretched uh, stretches of sea coast from which all fishing is prohibited are all tell tales of community driven conservation time so my first question to you is uh, what does western ghats mean to these communities you work with how do they perceive uh, nature around them yeah thank you um my head is still reeling from pranay's you know universe uh, doordrishti view and coming back to the you know zoom in view to one particular community that lives in the western ghats so i may be a bit all over the place no no, no. please don't worry about it <laughs> yeah but it was fascinating pranay absolutely fascinating i felt like i was having a, a live uh, uh, conversation you know on you know take off or going forward from the sapiens uh and that book took me long enough to digest <laughs> so uh but yeah so coming back to uh, what uh, we do in the western ghats and the kind of uh, organization uh that has worked on conservation ground up i think for us uh, i can only say it in very simple terms that uh, we map the science to the traditional wisdom that already exists within uh, communities uh 
they know it, I mean, possibly, um, you know, oral traditions of uh, uh, looking at uh, uh, sacred groves, like you mentioned, or Devarkadu in the Western Ghats. Specifically, we, we primarily work in the central Western Ghats and the coastal Karnataka. And when we talk to those communities, it's like a, a lot of it is wisdom is already lost. So us trying to revive and trying to understand and mapping it from a scientific point of view to say, okay, so this is what their understanding is. These are the kind of species that existed. It's all folklore. It is uh, sometimes also, you know, songs in songs, in plays, it, oral traditions, religious texts, uh, uh, rituals. Uh, plenty. So there's that itself, like the story of migration, there's also been migration within communities here. And when you talk about the kind of amalgamation of cultures that's already happened, we feel that there's a, unless there is a kind of, uh, you know, looking at the pieces in the puzzle, uh, so where we, where we have the zoom out view, uh, and then you come into the zoom view and you look at the pieces of the puzzle. So for us, as uh, having worked with communities, we look at, okay, fine. So we understand how important the bee species is to uh, you know, the surrounding ecosystem in terms of its uh, uh, evolution. Uh, the, you know, when you talk about the Devarkadus, till today we can see those species there, uh, some of the photographs that are outside. We see them, I've seen them myself, some of them, and you, the diversity you see in that small, say we work on mapping, uh, identifying and mapping freshwater swamps. And among them, say we've mapped, there were only about 50 as per official records, but we kind of discovered a few more. And so as of now, 110 of them are scientifically mapped. And out of these, uh, we identified on the basis of speaking to communities who live around these areas, we identified about 11 of them who, which are classified sacred uh, swamps. And swamps are a kind of whole ecosystem by itself with the multiple layers that Pranay mentioned earlier. You know, the microbes, the, the amphibians, the, uh, the flora, fauna, the bee multiple kind of species, even the larger primates like the lion-tailed macaque, which is again endangered. Um, when you look at the sacred uh, swamps, uh, you would find uh, that the communities, uh, through various rules and rituals and religious, multiple faiths, they, they created this system of protection. Mm. And the weirdest thing is when we started researching these, we found that many of these uh, conserved uh, or pristine uh, ecosystems are closest to habitation, not furthest. You wouldn't think they are deep interior. You'd yeah. think, and that kind of gives you think, gets you thinking, and that's what the research actually revealed, that uh, communities understood the ecosystem services being provided or provisioned by these local ecosystems. And so they created these rules saying, you're the closest to habitation. You see that these say, you talk of the freshwater swamps, kind of a perennial water source. So they had these rituals around uh, Chaudi, which is a goddess, mm -hmm. um, and how she needs to be, uh, what do you say, you know, uh, kept happy. And so there were certain things that were rules put in place uh, there were certain rituals there. You couldn't do this. You could do that. You can't take out any of the leaf or even a twig. You couldn't remove from that sacred uh, preserved area. And when you think about the, I believe uh, the population increase around these habitats now is 40, 50 times more than what it was earlier. I mean, as per known history. And uh, in spite of that, these areas have stayed the same, more or less, in pristine. In fact, we use the sacred groves. There are a lot of degradation that's happened um, for various reasons, we know that. You know, that's development as we know it. So uh, there have been a lot of land use change. There's been a lot of degradation that's happened to those swamp areas or the uh, habitat of the LTMs, uh, various other um, wildlife or even uh, native trees. And we find there that uh, when these communities are 
kind of given these rituals and these belief systems, the believers act as a kind of a sena, you know, to protect and to stop. So there is always, they have, and they have the core zone, which is your nothing can move from there. And then they have the buffer zone in place. So all of these are through discussions with the religious leaders there, or um, each one had a role in society uh, where they were able to say, okay, so this person looks after the, the water part of it. Mm -hmm. And so the rituals conducted around the water goddess was done by this particular community. This other community looks after the other species in terms of, you know, the frogs, etc. So there was an, uh, the uh, Naga, you know, mm -hmm. the god, uh, serp serpent god. Um, there was, of course, the mother goddess of all for who had to be appeased all through the year. Uh, very interesting. And, you know, in light of the recent uh, Kantara and uh, Ganda the Guri kind of movies that have come out, it's nice that these have come on to the mainstream consciousness. Uh, there is a reason uh, behind uh, a lot of the conservation practices. Uh, if you can kind of align those practices uh, without, uh, you know, to, uh, to, with the idea or the, the knowledge of the ecological um, uh, provisions they provide to the communities. Uh, you know, sponge, they, uh, freshwater sp uh, water swamps act as sponges. Um, they perennially, uh, they provide, uh, uh, they feed water throughout the year um, to uh, the five major river systems that emerge out of the Western Ghats. The Western Ghats, the unique um, bioreserve that it is, it also controls or decides uh, the, you know, the monsoon patterns. So there's just so much, the interconnectedness that Pranay brought out. We actually see that happening. In, on the ground. And we see that uh, the understanding that communities have uh, may be perhaps intuitive or maybe on the basis of lores, folklores around it. Um, you know, you know, Bhuta Bharate. There is a Bhuta uh, God uh, also for protecting the swamps. So they, the kind of uh, interlinkages that they have been able to uh, bring forth. It's helped us a lot in the kind of work we do. Um, the traditions continue, even though there has been uh, quite a bit of external influences. Uh, don't really know to what extent, um, but I think there's a very important, uh, especially understanding we're getting more and more about uh, um, uh, microbial ecosystems. I think there's a very urgent need uh, to start looking at uh, these pristine uh, sacred groves or sacred swamps as your reference ecosystem yes. and then try to see you know what science what technology I'm, I'm actually a fan of technology though I'm a bit of a dadi in technology but still uh, you know I do understand the ecosystem mapping understanding using all of those tools to see how these reference ecosystems can be replicated yeah Got it. Thank you. And uh, I did a little bit of uh, research on uh, Devar Kadus and the conservation of the community. But one interesting fact was uh, they'd done a study in for on the Amazon Indians uh, and the, the ones who live on Amazon. Uh, many, many centuries ago, they had vocabulary for 500 to 800 words around their ecosystem, which even as uh, English vocabulary, we don't know what a leaf does, but they could go have a vocabulary for a particular leaf, like the sundew has one, the lantern has one, like this, they had different, so they knew their ecosystem very well uh, than we do. Uh, so the, the, my next question to you, Aruna, is uh, uh, the narrative of everything getting destroyed uh, often overshadows the positive work um, a lot of the communities do and continue to do. Uh, for them, an extinction cannot happen. Uh, it's part of their life. They understand the threshold of abundance. They know when it is down. They know how to control it. Um, can you highlight a couple of positive work uh, some of the community members in the Western Guards are doing 
for the conservation uh, from a conservation purpose? Um, yeah, a, a lot of it they do actually. So uh, conservation is very community centric. Uh, they are the leaders, they are the change makers on the ground. Uh, they are also extremely, uh, uh, what do you say, protective. Um, it really, uh, I think if there are influences from the outside, uh, they have, we've also seen them and this has been a part of our own history with, as Neha Kunja working with these communities uh, is, you know, when the marine ecosystem a few years ago, um, a decade ago, was threatened due to the uh, thermal uh, project that was to come up in that Sharavati uh, region, the protests that were led by the local community leaders right to the point that, of course, there were a few helpful souls who could get their voice heard, uh, made it, uh, you know, made the government actually reverse its decision. So I think that's, that's community activism at its best. Um, another thing is that uh, when, uh, when you talk about these communities, their, um, one of the things I said was the rituals and the rules that governed the forest habitats. There was a community that decided you know, what fr uh, wild fruits could be harvested, what medicinal plants could be harvested and how much. Mm. And they decided and they put a ban. Mm. So, you know, they knew how much they need to take and how much would sustain them and how it would be beyond. Of course, uh, one of the first reasons why we started work in uh, the Western Ghats was in 2013. Uh, my champion change maker, I call him, he was uh, Narsima Hegde, he's a forest ecologist. He's most likely listening to it on YouTube. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Wonderful. So Narsimha is, uh, you know, I've trekked the Western Ghats and the coastal areas with him through. He, he takes great pleasure taking me in, during the monsoons with a real uh, slime and slug fest and leech fest. <laughs> so it's been, uh, it's been very inspiring. And uh, a lot of my learning has come from him. And of course, all the interactions which I've enjoyed with the forest dwellers. Yeah. You see some amazing diversity of, uh, uh, you know, uh, indigenous communities. He, he hates the word tribal, so I'll avoid using that. Okay. Indigenous communities that live there. And uh, so these come from as far as Africa. Uh, we've interacted, they are superb, uh, you know, wild bee, honey collectors, they climb the tallest, the Indian rock bee, they are the honey harvesters. Um, they are extremely, they have of course amalgamated into the local culture, they look Indian, they, they speak a kind of dialect from there, but uh, the features are uh, quite uh, <laughs> originally African there, and there are a few other such uh, communities, indigenous communities. So what really, uh, um, so you have to remind me of the question. The honey. Uh, oh, the question. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, uh, around the positive uh, yes. world. So um, there's a whole lot that uh, uh, community. One one thing is, uh, say, vanishing vanishing species of indigenous trees, mm. and uh, we have a lot of community owned tree nurseries. Uh, you know, patta patta unko pata hai. So they kind of have the traditional names for it. And um, they, uh, you know, go collecting into the forest. They bring out the pods, they bring out the saplings, and then we support them in, in uh, scientific methods of propagation uh, for these uh, community. And these community owned tree nurseries are supplying, it's a sustainable activity as a livelihood. And they supply these tree saplings now to the Department of Forest. And so it's a kind of, you know, they, uh, we also have the system of village forest committee, uh, village, village forest committees. Uh, the British had another, um, uh, 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 an inherited system now, which still the communities follow there, which was called the Sopinabetta. And these bordered uh, the Haviaka farmlands, uh, orchards, basically, areca and other kinds of pepper orchards. And obviously, the British were interested in protecting their uh, pepper supply. And, and so what they did basically was 
they created this system where rights were given on these adjoining lands with the condition that forest cover has to be maintained. So these beta lands, uh, after the British left, the rights continue with the community. They have village forest committees that have been formed who take a common uh, governance approach over these beta lands. And then the Department of Forest is technically the overseer or the man, but they do nothing about it. So there's been a lot of good amount of degradation that has happened. Uh, um, these were basically, uh, you know, common uh, for for the pepper growers to get their green leaf manure, yeah. other grazing lands, etc. And so with this degradation, now with the with the communities, we've started the whole uh, idea of uh, restoring these beta lands. The beta lands also formed a very important forest corridor yeah. for, uh, say, uh, the primates, especially the lion-tailed macaque, which is highly endangered. So for me, it's like if the tiger, uh, you know, tiger is the poster boy of uh, World Wildlife Fund, uh, you know, conservation. For us in the Western Ghats, it's the lion-tailed macaque. Yeah. Extremely shy, beautiful creature. Uh, yeah. We have a couple of photos, I think, outside. Outside, yes, yes. yes. And, uh, you know, uh, it's funny. Abhishek is here. Abhishek told me to uh, look at this. On my on our way from Mangalore uh, to Bangalore, uh, as soon as you start crossing, I think, Agumbe, uh, supposedly there's a, a family of lion-tailed macaques who have been driven into this human conflict so much that they've now started begging. On the, They are very shy. But just this family, and you can, as soon as you drive in, we saw them because, you know, we couldn't take a U-turn. It's such a small road. But they're no different than the other primates who are also on the street. But you don't get to see them. And they're so unique. But they've gotten into our world. And it's very unfortunate. But uh, they're beautiful. They're also endemic uh, to Western Ghats as well. So they are beautiful. Um, thank you. And I, I can correlate with the loss of train of thought, especially in... Uh, uh, theme like Western Ghats or ecology because uh, preparing for this event, I have crashed my Chrome nine times because every tab leads to another. Oh my God, what is this? Oh my God. So I can only imagine the train of thoughts, how it is. So please don't uh, worry about it. I'm going to come back to Pranay you now. Um, this, the third chapter we want to split. We spoke about observing and understanding a little bit of the ecological history. Uh, I, we'd love to hear the three-day lecture. We'll pri probably come back and call you for it. Uh, we interpreted it from some aspect of the community, and I'm sure there are more stories uh, as well. And then the third one is nurturing uh, around it. And how, does, uh, how, does, how do we think about putting some of this together in today's world? So this is for the both of you, and the question is common, and either one of you could pick and then, and then follow it up, is... Um, uh, where do we begin as city dwellers to learn a little more about uh, about the importance of uh, losing nature? And the reason is, the, the more I read, the more I understand that the further you're away and the further the actor is taken away from the consequence, there is no more remorse for it. And I, I, I don't care if a species of ants go extinct because I'm in white field in Bangalore and it doesn't matter. But for the community, that is a big deal. And they're fighting for their lives to protect it. So if we were to begin understanding as city dwellers some aspect of what this really means, the significance, where can we begin? Either one of you could take it up. Okay, okay so, I'm going to, <laughs> so I'm going to start from the point that uh, Aruna made about uh, microbes. I think, uh, you know, the fact that the world is run by microbes, I mean, think think about it, 30% of our mass is microbes, right? Um, and I, my second book, let me just say that it also started here because I did this podcast with uh, Pawan Srinath, which actually got transcribed into the book. But, uh, you know, I talk about how viruses are important for you. While we were cursing COVID and I was at the front lines of, uh, you know, looking at the COVID uh, pandemic, I mean, part of it, a small part of it in, in a hospital in Delhi. Um, 
the challenge is that you know we tend to say that all viruses are bad all microbes are bad you know those kind of things ant dying in 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 a in a sacred grove has no meaning for you in white field um the interconnectedness is is where the whole story comes in and like the dodo example that i gave so the the sooner we start to appreciate this that how no, no matter how tenuous the uh, the linkage is it still has to be maintained mm-hmm. i also said that you know there are minerals and rocks that are the same numbers as mammals exactly the same numbers actually uh you know there are rocks that are getting extinct because we are putting them in our homes or we are pulverizing it to extract on the ore that's happening right so there are landscapes both above and underground that are getting you know pulverized excavated raped i think that's something that we have to look at so if that goes you're changing the nature of not just the landscape but also the subterranean levels of water you're talking about changes in the quality of soil because how water moves around that rock or or soil is very different mm. so it's it's like a mind sweeper game you know you make a subtle change in one very tiny part of a very large landscape and you think that you know just extracting that rock is not going to hurt anybody but you know we need to also start looking at what is the sustainable level of extraction that we need to do for rocks as well and i think the same is true for you know everything uh we we still don't know you know like i said we don't know what what runs uh what keeps ecosystems in balance we don't know that we still don't know which is the largest oxygen provider in the world you know so the story that i talk about in my second book is that if all the viruses in the world were to go on strike for just one day there was going to be massive extinction for example your stomach is going to burst open because what keeps your bacteria in check in your gut are viruses so, th- so let's not pray for uh, things that we don't know about right it's 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 very foolhardy of us to say let's let's all use uh, antiretrovirals and get ri- rid of say viruses i think that's that's where we are just now i think that's what we do with uh, chemicals i think that's what we do with uh, so many of these extraneous things that we get into our lives uh many of which we extract from nature mm. and release it in high concentration in another part right i think uh, uh so many things i mean you've got uh batteries that are being made from ores that are being you know procured from bolivia and peru and uh, cold tan that's coming from uh, from congo it's all going into our phones or in our cars electric vehicles but what happens after that what happens after that rock gets extinct there uh, and you have a concentration of mineral here there's going to be immense damage to the larger ecosystem of peru or congo or wherever and the same is happening here i mean we not just uh, those two come to mind because they are most relevant to us because we can't live without our phones uh but the same could be hit, said about say steel because we've been ex- extracting i don't know or coal that we have been extracting you know uh all these things need to have a limit and i don't think we understand that at all so completely driven by economics and not ecology that's i think the crux of the current in- inequities whether it's at the community level or the larger global uh you know business level i think that needs a a a framework to to bring in the balance um and um, i'm not sure i think this is i'm treading into your territory so yeah mm-hmm. yeah i don't know that's a nice seg for me uh yeah uh i'm so glad you brought up that thing about uh, you know payment for ecosystem services is a conceptual understanding of uh, what are the capitals that belong on a balance sheet and when we talking about all the extractive businesses or the all the extractive companies uh, across the world so that was possibly the way of life and that's what our, from the point of view of understanding or our, our frame of reference was that that point of time we've come down we have traversed this path i'm not to sure what extent we can traverse back i don't think we can live without our phones electricity etc but 
uh, how do we get to the point where we, like Pranay said, you know, not reduce everything down to its minuscule essence. Everything is a single, uh, like uh, urea is like NPK, nitrogen. For you know, it's not necessary. Why? Why not look at holistic? Uh, look at other balances that using something in its entirety, replacing it, uh, ensuring that you don't have an overbalance. Um, you know, these are things that perhaps are some things that learnings that we can do things to, uh, uh, you know, reset the button. And I think the reset button is in the hands of us, in the hands of our communities. I definitely think it's in the hands of our communities because they're understanding. See, they live a de facto sustainable life. Uh, not because they don't want to have the things that we all have. Uh, they also have the same set of aspirations. So... It's, it's, you know, we behaving like, I mean, the global north behaves to the global south and we NGO guys like to really blame everything on the global north. Uh, but we have the same attitude the city dwellers have over our rural communities. And, and so what we do here with the level of plastic we use, with the level of, you know, the lack of understanding of what water bodies are, uh, what's the important ecosystems uh, that... Uh, these water bodies in cities, lakes, my pet love or hate for Bangalore is, uh, you know, the destruction or the rejuvenation of lakes. Um, we do a bit of rejuvenation of lakes, but based on biodiversity uh, and ecological principles, these are small lakes. But if you look at the budget of a BBMP or the Lake Development Authority, it's like development is you know, concretizing, putting the lights, you know, cutting off all the shrubbery so there are no snakes or whatever it is. And, um, you know, these are things perhaps we need to rethink. Yeah. We need to perhaps have a bit more. Uh, and by, uh, by uh, being part of a city which is, uh, has a worldwide reputation, citizens here can raise the voice for our Western Guards. It's our backyard. A lot of what happens here is getting impacted there. Similarly, from there to the rest of the world, the interconnectedness is, I mean, it's just so obvious it's hitting us in our face, left, right, center. So if there is a way, I mean, frankly speaking, I have a long wish list, <laughs> but I don't think I should go through that wish list in front of everyone. You should here. catch everybody but I'm happy outside and whoever yeah, is yeah, willing yeah. <laughs> to do. But yes, pollination, uh, you know, bees are dying. Our great Albert Einstein said, if the bees uh, uh, vanish from our earth, uh, the humankind vanishes within, I don't know, less than four days or something like that, right? So what can we do as city dwellers to keep that pollination? It can't be possible in the city. Here we go spraying buildings where those hives are formed with pesticides. So you add to the <laughs> whole mess. So... Uh, what can we do for reviving uh, water bodies uh, or creating a biodiversity zone around water bodies so that you can have create a, a safety, you can have migratory birds come in. You can, you, there are multiple things one can do. So everything, if we can connect it to actually um, this whole concept of sustainable consumption and production, um, I think uh, we, that way would be the way to go. Uh, planting trees, yes, but in the right ones in the right place, uh, like he said. So uh, it's not just kind of, you know, go plant the pongamias or whatever. <laughs> uh, in all in so um, uh, I, I don't know. There, like I said, I have a wish list and I'd be most happy to collaborate with anyone here or anyone listening in from far uh, on the multiple um, mini projects one can take up to you know, keep the whole in view all the time and then just see, okay, what's that little bit that we can tackle? It's like a knitting, uh, you know, the pieces kind of are so well connected to each other. So if there are a way to, you know, look at a certain pattern or a certain design and say, okay, I fit this in here, let me fix this, perhaps we will get there. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, we'll open up questions from the audience while uh, I ask my next question. If if you've got a question, yeah, uh, please hold your questions. A bunch of more are there. Perfect. Um, 
there are a lot of young ecologists listening in on youtube live today uh, there are quite a few of them um maybe from uh, i know you mentioned ecology and you are a little far away but you are at the um, at the receiving end of what an ecologist is taught the impact comes to you so we'd love to hear your opinion maybe prana you as well how does the future look for them for the young ecologists who are just stepping into the field what does the future look for them i think uh, you know we are witnessing the sixth extinction in different uh, ecosystems at different rates so i think it's a very exciting time uh you're going to see what happened uh, you could perhaps now develop models of all the previous uh, five uh, great extinctions actually there are 11 but five are major um so you know depending on the speed at which we build uh, different uh, kinds of uh, uh, you know we, we study different kinds of ecosystems i think you could build models of saying oh this what perhaps happened in the permian or this happened in the silurian age or whatever right so that's possible um i just wanted to actually go back uh, sure. one 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 point that you were talking about uh, you know western ghats being the in the backyard of bangalore i think had the western ghats not been there bangalore's weather would have been completely different you would have been a sem- semi arid zone because uh, you know a bit like uh, uh you know tirunelveli and you know that area uh, the central uh, south central tamil nadu so it would have come till about central karnataka um and that's because of that palghat gap and two other minor gaps that give you that wonderful weather that you are blessed with so i think uh, you know the western ghats contribute immensely uh both in terms of moisture even when during the non monsoon periods there's enough capture of the the moisture from the sea breeze that comes in towards the land and also the trees in in the the area between bangalore and the sea that provide their moisture to you the 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 cooling effect is largely attributable to the the physiography of the western ghats so i think uh, that's the reason for you to celebrate the western ghats if not for anything else perfect so we owe western ghats the pleasure of ilai raja hot bhajis and bondas <laughs> during the weather i get it now i get it aruna your thoughts on what is the future looking for people who are getting into a field either as ecologists or as the executioners yeah i think ecologists are the sexy breed now <laughs> um narsimha has always been sexy so there i'm pleasing him some more uh, but then uh, uh, yes uh, because let's uh, leaving aside this uh, i want to come back to that you know payment for ecosystem services right polluter pays principle these are all very important kind of hooks that uh, ecologists uh, and uh, uh, upcoming ecologists can actually have a voice in mm. uh, because uh, with this you know the carbon markets are hot i mean we implement quite a few Uh, we implemented india's first blue carbon project with the conservation of uh, mangroves uh, degraded mangroves in the uttar kannada region now we're expanding it to about 600 hectares and these are certifiable certified uh, verified carbon credits and these have are bought by uh, companies in the voluntary com- uh, carbon market um, that money flows into conservation that money flows to communities so the way we've done it is that the agreement on say this many private farmers who have given their fallow lands actually you know the acidic uh, uh, saline lands bordering the estuaries uh, they have given their lands and we have about 150 plus farmers who signed these agreements to conserve them for 15 years and the carbon credits from these because mangroves are the most efficient carbon sinks actually the freshwater swamps are even more efficient than mangroves in uh, uh, being an, uh, a, a strong carbon sink but um, unfortunately uh, these the standards for verified carbon credits from freshwater swamps are not uh, 
decided yet by the voluntary carbon markets. And so that's the reason why we said that uh, communities and ecologists and youngsters, they can kind of see perhaps where this dollar gets invested, how it gets invested. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if you have to plant trees, like I said, plant the right trees in the right places. If you have to conserve mangroves, look at it, not, you know, a single fast growing species and huh, forest department says, I have done you know, my 500 hectare ban gaya. But what? One, that kandla will keep repeating itself. So where's diversity, right? Uh, there's so much that happens with one hectare of mangroves getting uh, conserved as per ecological principles. Uh, the marine life, the, you know, uh, the nesting opportunities for various uh, fishes, etc., the diversity. So many things that you can actually link to how what happened in this small little patch. Uh, I just find it amazing. I just, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of so uh, like uh, looking at, I, I, I mean, again, I'm digressing here, but I'd like to bring it here because communities know this. There are all these systems that are, they have these processes. Uh, there are the, where we work there, there are these Gajani lands, they call them. I mean, not the Gajani movie guy, but Gajani lands. These are, lands that border the mangroves or the, the, they, they between the uh, sea and the freshwater. And they had this very complicated, uh, uh, you know, like the Dutch have that uh, water sluice gate system. They had mastered this. Now it has become ex extinct. And here they used to grow rice, which was the kagga variety. We're trying to now revive that system to see, talk to these Gajani landowners. Like Gajanis are the parts large. I mean, you have like thousands of hectares of fallow lands, which don't have a single owner. And they have left been left fallow because there's no other agriculture possible there. So we're looking at these lands to see, to talk to, you know, there's various Gajani. Gajanis are like patidars, like the godfathers of those patches of lands. And then to see how we can work with the, with the Gajanis, uh, to implement or revive kaga rice varieties, which are saline resistant, salt water resistant rice. I mean, how amazing is that? And they had, you know, these uh, medicinal uh, purpose, uh, kind of diabetic friendly rices, all kinds of. So there's just so much diversity, even in just looking at food, how our food systems have been uh, corrupted by the mainstream understanding of scale. How can we have a more food systems approach to localize food consumption and production? Uh, you know, all of that is circular economy. All these are buzzwords perhaps, but we can actually see them happen in small pockets yeah. where we work. And it would be wonderful to see scale in the light of replication and adaptation rather than cookie cutter large scale, you know, where stuff gets trucked my miles and miles adding to the carbon. Yeah, so multiple things that I can think of. Got it. Okay, I think we had a gentleman there with the question. The, mic uh, the microphone's coming from behind. Come on when you're ready. Hi. Um, my name is Deepak Basavraj and I represent a team called Ingala, which means carbon in Canada. And uh, it's not just questions. I have uh, a few things which I'll share, and uh, uh, and it's for all of you. So first, I see some foreigners here, so I'd like to share that uh, when Aruna means they were a betta, it means gods. Uh, they were a kado means it's they gods forest. So in India, if we relate anything to religion, so people follow it, and it's that's what it is. So so it's just that, and so pina betta means uh, greens hillock of greens. So greens is what humans and animals consume. So just sharing that. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, uh, this is for Pranay, that uh, when he mentioned dodo of uh, Mauritius, uh, it was an amazing bird. And uh, there's another thing to Mauritius and coming from history, which Pranay is you know, favorite thing, that Mauritius is believed to have uh, in, during the tectonic a few million years ago have a bro broken off from Western Ghats and that's so Mauritius and Western Ghats have similar biodiversity and Mauritius is one of the world's uh, fastest degrading 
biodiversity is very unfortunate. So should we be concerned about Western Ghats in, in that sense? So one is that. Why I know this, I, I'm, uh, I work in the realm of permaculture, regenerative agriculture, soil regeneration. So that's my forte. I, I do that for a living. So I'm a natural farming consultant in holistic uh, you know, approach. So that's how we design farms and do the soil. I've, uh, we have successfully regenerated soils in Kurukshetra, Haryana, where uh, uh, conventional uh, farming uh, experts have said, either kuch nahi ogega, which literally means nothing will grow here. And in 25 days after we have worked with the soil, earthworms were found. We don't introduce, it's there. So our people just like, you know, took out earthworms. So we can do it. We have to work with mother nature, just sync with her, basically. So <laughs> one is the, the dodo part, which he mentioned is amazing. So there are, every day there are birds and, uh, you know, animals and uh, microbes which are going extinct and we don't even know about them. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, uh, I, have, I haven't read uh, Pranay's book yet, but uh, it's there for our, in our list to purchase. So one of the... One of the one of our uh, Bibles is the hidden life of trees. If many of you would have like Peter Wollobin's book, it's an amazing book, and uh, and I would I would like to share a few things. That is uh, one one is uh, Aruna's efforts and uh, her people are out there, and uh, you know the the produce being sold uh, sold is from your uh, thing. Right? She's selling it for like dirt cheap. No way I'll sell it at that price. Bangaloreans will say, oh, something is wrong with this. That's why it's being sold. It's the city dwellers, please, we have to work on the pricing. Okay. So, because I connect, I work with, we work with farmers all the way in Nagaland, Haryana, Chhattisgarh, and I connect produce. I'm 48 years old. I've never had allopathic medicine in my life. Even an accident, rib bone broken, I treated it with plants. Okay. Hadijot plant works. We humans don't have that patience to undergo pain for a few minutes also. That's the problem. So, and like Aruna has been referring, the indigenous people know things. And then we have to make that effort. It's, it's about awareness. I was in a, a film festival just last uh, weekend, Alt F, if you're Alt EFF, -F, if you all were there. So there was a movie about bees, beehives in cities, amazing movie. Uh, done by a lady who was curious that uh, the bee is uh, in the 15th, 16th floor. Every year it's coming back. The, um, you know, um, Apis cordata or something like that. Not Apis uh, serana indica, that's the Indian bee. So there are a lot of people making efforts, but then um, I guess Vinod and his team's effort of bringing it together, making it a community. And Mycelium is lifeline. And what a name to have, Mycelium Ecology. Wow. So, I mean... So we have to, the tribe has to increase. And uh, Aruna was mentioning about uh, ecologists being sexy. Yeah, ecologists are the latest software engineers 20 years ago, what was happening. So five years from now, the girl's father will say, if you are into nature, I will get my daughter married to you. Otherwise, no. So that's what it's going to be. And it has to be. Otherwise, you know, things won't work. So everyone has to take interest. So the, that's what I wanted to share. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to uh, go back to that first question and have Pranay answer that? Yes. Which is, uh, yes. In, why well, in, in K, what is, is Pranay aware of this? And a uh, couple of other things for ecologists. There is uh, something called meet.at at gmail.com. It's a Google group, meet.at. Yeah, all the ecologists are from meet.at. Oh, okay. All of them are live from their room. Great, great. Yeah, so, it. so I mean, for people here, if yeah. they didn't know some of them, so that's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so, it's the, the question would be, like, if you have come across this, that I have read about it, that Mauritius broke off from the Western Ghats and the biodiversity of Mauritius is degrading at a very fast pace so should western guards or should we be like you know wary of it or like what do you think about it i think you're spot on i think uh, although the land mass is similar the recolonization and colonization of uh, uh, of mauritius happened multiple times so there are uh, yeah. different species there are some that crossed over from madagascar a little later uh, the 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 relict population that separated from Western Ghats to uh, Mauritius was largely uh, the 
uh, gymnosperms, right? So because the the age of the angiosperms uh, had not begun in, in in full scale. So yeah, I mean cycads, ferns, uh, uh, palms, uh, all of them are at risk. Uh, uh, you're, you're you're spot on. I think the bigger risk, I, uh, to my mind, in in Mauritius is uh, the um, excessive uh, planting of sugarcane, which uh, I think uh, there's very little. Uh, you know, reserve forests that should uh, should have got created, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, and another thing for me uh, is looking at the extinction of uh, uh, of microbes because they're they're you know you have a granitic layer, and then you've got a few other very interesting rocks that exist in Mauritius that developed after that 120 million years ago when it's it it, it moved away from India from the Indian plate. So I think those young rocks also offer such amazing opportunities for growth of or the evolution of microbes. Uh, we don't appreciate that at all. So I think uh, also basalt is very interesting because there was an overflow of basalt there. So uh, of course Rodriguez and uh, Mascarene and you know the other islands north uh, are also very fascinating. Yeah, there's a place called Valley do Color in. Well, yeah, Absolutely I, beautiful. I mean, amazing. I mean, Shamel, for example, the beautiful colors of Shamel uh, rocks yeah, yeah, are yeah. absolutely divine. Yeah. And one last thing I wanted to share is that reference of Pranoy when he said the dust moving. There is a, I mean, some of you may have seen on Netflix, Latif Nasir's connected series. The episode is called Dust. So it's from the Republic of Shad and where how it settles down in the Amazon forest. So if some of you want to see it. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there another question? There's one at the back, yeah. Here, on the right. Uh, hi, I'm Jaya Vartni. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a researcher in the policy space, and it's really nice to have uh, you know, such a composition in this panel. Uh, and it makes me very happy that uh, disciplines are interacting in such a way that it creates an impact as solid as this. Uh, one, my, one, a question I had was, um, we were talking about how uh, folklores and you know tales from indigenous communities uh, are such thick evidences of uh, conservation practices, customary rights that these communities have had for so long. Uh, I wanted to understand if um, you know these practices of archiving or rather knowledge production uh, uh, does at all translate into the kind of policies we design. Uh, for conservation, for you know, like designing reserve uh, boundaries and things like that, uh, is there or rather where do you start, uh, you know, translating these uh, archival or knowledge production practices into such uh, uh, large-scale uh, instruments of change making? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, actually, um, it's quite uh, miserable as of. Uh, now uh, and there's not much research and it, especially the Western Guts is very little research done or even archiving uh, on in terms of the uh, you know various uh, Devarkadu or the kind of rituals and practices of the faiths uh, prevalent and these are still being practiced like I said in spite of the external influences these are the sacred groves are still functioning pristine ecosystems. So there is something to be said about uh, integrating a, a, a faith-based approach to conservation involving communities. Uh, but I'm afraid it doesn't have the necessary policy space or enough research done. Uh, um, the first, the, so it was in 2013-14 that we were the first to initiate this kind of work, and this has been published in various uh, science, uh, international reputed journals. Uh, uh, also, subsequent to that, we've had uh, uh, you know some funding from CEPF, the Critical Ecosystems Partnership Fund, and through that we were able to actually restore eight out of the 111 uh, degraded swamps, and there we used the uh, reference ecosystems of the sacred swamps. So I'm, uh, I don't think it finds uh, somewhere possibly uh, 
you know, being a more diverse and secular society as we move towards that and the globalization of cultures, uh, possibly the believer system itself may collapse uh, until and unless it can quickly be supported by like, you know, I'm saying we map the uh, scientific evidence to the uh, archival knowledge and wisdom of the communities. And if that then gets the validation or the, uh, you know, the conservation scientists, uh, you know, validate that significantly, then perhaps it has a space in the policy uh, formation. And that's perhaps, and that's where we are struggling. We feel, we feel like, you know, somewhere you get a bit overwhelmed when you try to look at, oh my God, there's so many things to be done. Oh my God, this is a problem. That's, so you, we, but at the at the implementation level, um, we feel that a lot. We feel the pressure. We feel the pressure of saying uh, somewhere, you know, uh, even getting our story across, getting these uh, some kind of mainstream. I mean, thanks to my Celia, I'm talking here, but who's list, who's willing to listen to me, or to many of our communities, right? So I think spaces like these need to be more and more visible in. Uh, uh, in you know big cities or where it matters. Um, also, I I have Kim, my colleague sitting next to you, who's been glaring down at me because I haven't brought one very important point into this conversation. Sorry, Kim, and that's gender, gender and conservation. These have such close interlinks, and this has also been a part of the tradition uh, or part of the roles that women uh, played in conservation. And in ecology, in ecology and understanding of the ecology of the uh, you know communities they lived in, so uh, we've done research on that. But where does that kind of link into practice, and where does that link into a space where uh, you can say that okay, fine, these things work. This is evidence. This is the scientific data. Now, how do we create a policy? Or how do we make an enabling environment for the, such initiatives to grow and multiply? Yeah. Got it. Got one question here on the left and one more here. And I think there's one. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. We'll start uh, with. There's one question on YouTube. I'll quickly ask that. It's yes. to Pranay. Uh, uh, this question is from one person that we know. Uh, and he specializes in this thing called as uh, invasive species of lantana, you know. So the question is stemming out of that. Uh, so what do you see as the impact of lantana in specific on Western Ghats? And what do you think is the future if the invasion continues? And are we in the right place to interfere and say that we need to do something about it, so to say? I think uh, the story of lantana is quite well known, I think most of you would know what it is. Uh, Lantana, Kamara, and I mean, there are six other species. So Lantana is this flower that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plant, it's a shrub that uh, has very pretty flowers. And many insects, uh, especially butterflies and moths, have come to like it. But that really doesn't mean that it is palatable for the others, especially the browsers. Uh, it was introduced in India from Central America in the late 1800s to prevent uh, elephants and gores and other browsers and you know rampaging animals rather. Actually, I think that's the word that uh, Troop used it. Uh, Troop uh, used it for calling it rampaging animals that uh, who come and invade bungalows. So it was put all along fences of uh, you know plantations and bungalows to prevent uh, marauding animals. And since then, it's just uh, it come up, comes up with these uh, berries, which are extremely prolific, and they just strike root. In Central America, it's not weedy. It's become weedy in India because there's no control. There's no biological control for this uh, plant. There's uh, no creature that would feed on it. You know. uh, what is the impact of uh, Plants like lantana or even say parthenium, which came much more recently, 1970s, with PL480. I don't know if uh, there are people here who remember of PL480. It's not my initials. It's, it's called uh, public lending, public lending 480. That was the grant that was given by the government of US 
when in the 70s it was suspected that india might suffer of 60s and 70s when india would suffer from a, a severe famine uh, so or, and a hunger uh, problem so uh, it, i mean it was largely political but along with the wheat came these seeds called uh, parthenium which is called congress grass in india is actually called congress grass because the american congress uh, you know passed the bill and the thing you know came and germinated in india in a very very prolific way so these i mean eupatorium is another cassia tora is another i mean there's so many of them that are you know widely seen across india uh they tend uh, they tend to change uh two things one of course they outcompete other shrubs and uh, it's largely through two or three processes i mean it could be allelopathy which means that they don't let any other uh, they produce these chemicals that deter growth of other plants around them or there could be special microbial manipulation that prevents the growth of others so it could be any of these factors uh therefore what we are looking at is two things one the biomass like eucalyptus or pongamia or uh, acacia uh, does not have many digesters you know there's no assimilation or digestion therefore there's no you know there's no build up of carbon stock in soil right because eucalyptus as you know just stays on the surface the same thing happens with lantana you cut a lantana shrub leave it there it just does not biodegrade because there are no organisms in india that have evolved in in a way to feed on the lantana leaf or the stem uh, the stem is even more woody and more difficult for it to digest so i think uh, you know the problem is that we'll have to look at eradication if we are trying to look at uh, reviving biodiversity especially in protected areas i mean i don't think uh, you know had it been a same country i mean new zealand would certainly not for example or costa rica would not allow the sale of lantana in nurseries but you go to any good nursery even in the lalbag nursery you'll find a lantana plant why should it be available you know why is this not a bio terror you know why is it not on the list of uh, putting it as as a as a as a plant that should be you know not should be hugely discouraged so i think that's where the problem is that uh, you know i don't think i'm making sense it is a forest killer but it it kills uh, you know not just the trees but you know shrubs and lichen and mosses and nematodes and microbes i think look at it as a whole system because you know the foresters have seen it only because it does not promote the growth of uh, sal or teak or or arjun or something you know i mean that's not the point i mean the point is larger you know it's just not a single tree that was uh, it's like you know like aruna said you know we attribute too much to the tiger you know i mean the tiger is charismatic the same thing happens with the forest trees also i don't think we have to invest so much of our efforts in saying getting teak or getting a sal forest intact is great it is good but remember that there are species other species malotus and 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 uh, you know grevillea and and uh, you know so many beautiful shrubs that need to come along with sal and teak which which we no, don't talk about forest department does not have them you know and it's great that you are doing something like this for rewilding because if you know the native species are brought back through communities and being sold through uh, to forest department because forest department is could not be concerned they want survival rates and eucalyptus and acacia gives them survival rates that's it I think there's a uh, yeah so please i don't know yeah to add on that um i think one of the things we did explore was uh you know the value chain development <laughs> we talked the main marketing language value chain development of lantana uh wood and uh, you know making products out of lantana and one way of perhaps curbing or finding an alternate use uh, also creating some livelihoods in the process uh but this thing about uh, i was shocked when i had gone on a recent visit uh, to a mangroves uh, replanted area they all talking about a weed that is uh, infecting the uh, mangroves which is supposed to be originating from new zealand and i was like and they they just trying to figure out you know how to deal with it and how did it even reach there So I don't know whether the bird flew from New Zealand and dropped it in a mangroves area or whatever it is but I'm just saying these you just have no idea what 
comes from where and uh, we don't have the local ecosystems evolved yet to yeah. handle those. Yeah, yeah good. Uh, I read recently the fascinating story of how coffee came to India. That's a, that's go. You should go read about how coffee was brought to India. But yeah, I think that answered the question. Uh, Ameya uh, on this side, on the left. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Abhisheka. Uh, I do belong to the community of sexy colleges. <laughs> but uh, more than that, my parents come from the Western Ghats of Karnataka, so I have a special interest in the landscape. I have two questions. My first question is to Aruna. Uh, you did talk about community-led conservation, and which is something I deeply believe in. But uh, the, the landscape that I come from, uh, I do see that um, whatever little patches of sacred groves that are left, it's uh, because of this fear of chowdi that they have. Uh, I mean, this is something I see in my parents' generation. But um, what the fear that I have is, with the youth, like as they, um, you know, the uh, nowadays the youth in that landscape don't really uh, follow uh, more, a lot of rituals. Uh, so, in the place that you work in, uh, what is uh, what is it that you notice with the youth? Are the are these traditional knowledge being passed on? Are they revered, or what? What do you see there? Thank you. Uh I think that people who are born in the uh, Western Ghats, you know, they kind of come out as ready-made PhDs in ecology. <laughs> so <laughs> they kind of learn it in the mother, the lap of nature. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, uh, the communities, at least the ones we work with, and they are uh, pretty embedded in that philosophy. Um, We've tried to do our bit in terms of trying to get the local schools and colleges um, as part of all the environmental volunteering activities uh, on a regular basis. So they do participate in a lot of these. But I think somewhere, like I mentioned earlier, the, the religious connotation somewhere needs to be replaced with the kind of modern sexy ecologist language. And then how do we then, you know, project that so that policies can fall into place. In the modern democratic world, that's our only, uh, what do you say, the bulwark against the uh, degradation that's happening, right? And so how do we get that kind of language to replace, maybe absorb what was done as tradition and then give it the kind of modern uh, scientific uh, lingo and get that passed as policies and protection uh, for the communities and for, you know, all creatures, great and small in that area. Thanks, that's helpful. I, I have a question from Pranay. Uh, how well is Central uh, Western Ghats studied in terms of uh, geology? Are there any, uh, you know, open resource publications that one can refer to? Uh, quite a bit, actually. I mean, but like I say, it's never enough because there's so many more questions. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I would recommend, uh, you know, uh, the Mangalore University has a very good geology department. Uh, the department in uh, Trivandrum University is very good. Pune University has done a lot of very good work. So I would, these would be my go-to and also CES, Center for uh, Ecological Studies uh, here in IISC. They have a pretty strong uh, team on geology. Uh, you know, so I would recommend uh, look at their papers. It's pretty, they are kind of open access research gate. Thanks to them, it's all available. Um, my, my name is Omeya. My question is really, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to change on a big scale, policy, government and all of that. But what can someone like me do if I want to work towards I don't know, advocacy, talk to people, make Instagram reels. I, I legitimately want to know what I can do. How can regular people participate, even if we're city dwellers and we remain city dwellers? But how can we participate in I'll helping to do this? your list of uh, things. I don't know, I was prepared for this. She's got a whole Superb. list of things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She's got a sheet for it. Yeah, please read it. This is what it is. Superb. I will come <laughs> and I will come and photograph that after the session. Yeah. No, no. 
So maybe you can sneak peek a one or two of what is written there. In there. Yeah, top three. Top That's a good three, one. right. It's very really difficult. Yes. Would you like to own a bee box and adopt bees? That's a great idea. <laughs> You've got yeah. the sign up outside, uh, yes, right so. next to the stall. Please do sign up for it. Yeah. And uh, see, one of the things uh, that we like to do as part of the work there is reduce pressure on forests. Yes. And a lot of communities do depend uh, on many things for the uh, and the forests. Uh, one of it is firewood. And uh, so one of the things we have been doing is as we keep getting trickles of money in, we look at fuel efficient dryers to install mm -hmm. there because a lot of the wild fruit, you know, those upege and your know, Garcinia species, uh, which have a high medicinal value, uh, all of these are collected by the forest dwellers and then they use firewood to actually dry them oh, okay. because uh, and so we, we have been placing these uh, traditional methods of drying with uh, fuel efficient dryers, which reduce pressure on forest uh, firewood by 83%. And that's a research that backs uh, this kind of a claim. So, you know, I mean, sponsor a dryer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and of course, um, you know, the community owned uh, speech, uh, nurseries where we plant indigenous. Uh, so that helps. Uh, the, the scheme we have for owning or uh, adopting bees and owning a bee box is basically your Western Ghat, our communities become your hosts. So your bee box gets hosted in their backyard or, or in the bordering forest areas. And they grow on your behalf the, uh, you know, for the off season uh, when, when bees are not able to forage or go into the forest areas, they grow a set of uh, indigenous flora and fauna, you know, plants and flowers and things like that, which we know this bees like. And then we grow them around in their homesteads. So maybe supporting that activity. It's also beautiful to just go see them. You know, the women are all excited about the all the different kind of flowers and things like that that grow there. So that's, I guess, my top two. And... Um, of course, the reforestation plant a tree. We don't have a scheme yet because we look at <laughs> 10,000, 20,000 hectares at a time, but uh, to plant or replant because that's the scale you would need for an Ingala project. <laughs> uh, but yes, you know, little bits of uh, water add up to the mighty sea. Indeed, so, indeed. Thank you. Great. I think we've got one, one here, Sushant, right here. And we'll probably have one more question. Do we have another one? Yes, on this right. Okay, perfect. There's one here. Perfect. All right. Two more. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Paya from Kobo Fermentary. And I'm uh, super happy today to, uh, to see so much spotlight being shone on microbes and the role that they play with this. And um, what I'd like to know a little bit more about today is um, the role that, and we know that trees have this, internal internet system, uh, which is mycelium, essentially, and how um, is, is there anybody doing work in the Western Ghats with, in this space, um, or like what's going on with the mycelium? Which, wood Wide Web. Uh, sorry? The Wood Wide Web, as it's exactly, called. Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, well, for one, mycelium ecology has just started work on it. Uh, but we don't, uh, I don't think we have uh, remotely even uh, initiated this work. One of the core uh, programs for us is to be able to enable research. But maybe Pranay or Aruna, in your expertise, any mycologists? Well, there's an Indian Mycological Society, which is very good, very, quite vibrant. Uh, I'm not entirely sure whether there's something specific to the Western Ghats, but mm -hmm. I'm sure there are researchers who are working on it. I mean, I know two people who work out of Kochi, and they're very, very good. I'm not certain whether they're looking at it from the, uh, you know, the the connectivity of or the connections, the tenuous connections between different species. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I think this is a huge area of work. It is. It was unfashionable till about ten years ago to even talk about it. Yeah. So I think uh, it's only good that it's gaining currency now. So. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, we'll probably finish this side and then finally come to this gentleman here. Hit the Sushant on this left. Yeah, right here. Yeah, this side. 
Hi, uh, a question a little bit related to what was asked behind. Um, I feel that all these discussions are great and mind-blowing, but we're a little bit preaching to the converted, right? Everybody who's here has some interest in the topic. So what is being done to raise interest in the little people? Because they are, they are the future and all that, but they're the ones who will have to carry this forward and who will probably, hopefully, make this conservation, preservation effort go where it needs to go. So what are the efforts being done to go to, especially city dwellers, children? The parents are far removed from the problems and the children, therefore, have really no idea. What's being done to get them interested, to kind of nurture their curiosity, to help them understand what the problems are without being panic makers. Just they have curiosity, they want to, they want to understand. They're new to this world. They want to make it better. You have any examples on what your world is doing? I mean, I'm happy to talk about why we built mycelium in the first place. This is uh, you, the same question I'd asked uh, when we were initially thinking about it. And Nishant, Abhishek, and I uh, also agreed that uh, um, there's a lot we could do. In fact, the word we say is we didn't inherit this planet from our ancestors. We borrowed it from our children. And I think we owe it to them uh, to at least keep it in a saner way when we hand it over to them. There's a lot of work we are initially thinking about. We are happy to... Uh, you you know, welcome you to contribute. We are uh, working with schools um, to build safe spaces for them to understand uh, this in the right way, understand nature. Uh, I have three kids and all of them are afraid of spiders. And I was until seven months ago when I, uh, you know, when I joined Mycelium Ecology, that's when I truly understood the importance of it and the beautiful thing of it. Um, I think one big thing we are focusing on is making it accessible so you're able to understand the difference between good or bad. We brought up in a culture where everything is bad. If that insect looks scary, don't go near it. But there could be something beautiful there. So we're trying to make it accessible. That's one of the big mediums we've done. We're partnering with cartoonists to bring some comic books, which brings characters like Purple Frog into light and the importance of it. Uh, all of these are work in progress. You are more than happy to help us contribute. And I think it has to be together as community, not one person. But maybe from your experiences, I know you said Ekalavya. Uh, you gave me that as a reference when I had asked you the same question, what can we do? But anything else you see as good examples? I think, uh, you know, like I said, uh, we are going to leave behind a planet which is much worse off, you know, for our children. And... And we are not even arming them with the tools on how we they should uh, fight the crises that they're going to face, whether it's climate change, whether it's contamination, whatever. Um, and we are not even helping them to stay curious because uh, I don't think we encourage critical thinking enough in our schools, at home. We are happy to give a gadget to a child and say, you know, stop hassling me, right? So that's kind of the attitude in most homes, I could say that with some certainty. Uh, how do we change this? The paradigm uh, needs a huge shift first from us as older people. I think we have to recognize this. I just want to go back to that question uh, the lady asked there, that what is it that I can do to contribute? I think, I think this is one of those things. I, the other thing, I mean, let me just backtrack. I'm sorry, I'm going to digress a bit. Is that, you know, taking the cue from Lantana, I mean, let's stop planting Deffenbachias and Monsteras and and lantanas in our homes. Why can't have, we have native trees and plants? Why don't we make it necessary that we uh, that you you know trees that are going to be planted in Bangalore city or wherever are going to be only native? We're going to have at least forty percent flowering plants, and of those forty percent plants, uh, twenty of those or, or fifty percent of those are going to be night flowering, because a lot of your moths are going to get extinct because they are they. <laughs> they move in at night and they're looking for white flowers and they don't find white flowers, right? So what do you do? So those are the kind of things that we have to plan as ecologists, right? We have to, we have to think that, you know, what is missing just now for all the creatures, right? 
The other thing is open burning. I mean, I come from the city of Delhi where open burning is like every citizen's right. You know, so you've got these stacks, these plumes coming out from just about every household. Everybody's burning litter. Uh, despite there being a ban, there's, you know, all those kind of things are a complete no-no. Uh, composting happens, but it is uh, not enough. Uh, how are we going to talk about carbon burial? I mean, things, I mean, I mean, we, I'm going to digress a bit. Let me just talk to you about something which is really close to my heart. Uh, you know, India's most produced product is a thing called BD. You know, cigarettes, you know, Indian cigarillos, hand-rolled cigarillos, right? Now, we make about 1 trillion BDs in a year. That's more than the number of pins, staples, safety pins that we make, right? There's no product that is produced in that number. 1 trillion BDs. And we know that it is designed to kill. It is the single largest cause of death among adult males in India. Preventable cause of death, okay? But to make a BD, you need to go to a forest in central India. You need to take that leaf out at the height of summer. The forest has no other uh, tree that has leaf on it. Tendu is the only tree that has leaf, right? After you extract all the leaf from the Tendu tree, you burn it up. You burn the forest floor. Now to make a BD, a product that kills you or kills most poor people, you use tribal communities to go into the forest to extract a leaf, which is perhaps the only source of shade for animals at the time, and then you burn the forest. Right? How perverse can it be? Right? So this kind of perversity should also be examined at the larger scale. We're talking of India's forests not as carbon sinks, but they're carbon sources. Because you are readily burning them. Right? And where is the rewilding happening? Not at all. There are only 30 or 40 good examples of rewilding in this country. Right? And there's so much to do. So I think let's start, even if you have a small balcony, make sure that you don't have trees that are exotics. They're not going to help you. They're nice because they're low maintenance. This is exactly the logic that the forest department uses because the, the forest department does not want a eucalyptus or an acacia to get grazed by a cow or a, even a ruminant from the forest, right? Let's avoid Brazilian and African exotics that are there. Dracaenas, I mean, I find that ridiculous. Yeah, you have Dracaena plants which are thought to be sacred. How are they sacred? How is it sacred in China? It's a plant found in Brazil. You know, how is it sacred in China? You know? So, so it just irritates me that, you know, you have the uh, adoption or the assimilation of exotic things into culture, religion, tradition for the, for the sake of it. I mean, BD is not native to India. It got discovered or invented the same time as the cigarette because it was a response to uh, the Swadeshi movement. So if anybody who says, you know, my Bab Dada or my great-great-grandfather used to smoke a BD, that's an absolute lie because there's no tobacco in India. You know, there, there were tobacco came from America to Europe via Columbus. And Columbus, 200 years later, from the Portuguese and the British came to India. So I think, ask those questions. You know, how do we know that, you know, that critical thinking element is clearly missing? And, you know, when we, you know, it's a very political argument that, you know, this is an easy way to, you know, uh, to justify something that is perverse. I mean, I use this word very, very carefully, but I think it's the only apt word which says it's perverse. Most of the things that you see around you are perverse. And we need to reverse those. Great. Okay. And we've got the, probably the final question here. Rohit has a question. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for it. Great. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Rohit. Uh, thank you for this enlightening conversation. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, so it's great to see uh, Pranay talk about uh, or lay emphasis on rocks because I feel even in the uh, conservation world, uh, 
a lot of emphasis obviously on flora and fauna but we don't uh, talk too much about uh, geology and rocks and that gets overlooked and i and the indian subcontinent has one of the most amazing uh, geological histories as i think more people need to uh, know about it and uh, we need to sort of lay uh, emphasis or focus on how these rocks are getting extinct because of mining and like he mentioned we use all these fancy tiles in our homes and it, it may get extinct from the natural landscape uh, but then i have a question specifically on western ghats i think the government came out with two reports uh, committees one was the ghatgil committee and about uh, uh, designating the western ghats as a ecologically sensitive zone and so ghatgil committee recommended i think 100% of the ghats to be uh, ecologically sensitive zone but then from what i have read i don't know if it's true like is it true that the local community sort of oppose uh, designation of the entire landscape as ecologically sensitive and then they came out with the kasturi rangan committee which said only 30% should be uh, sens a sensitive zone and and so uh, what is the um, sort of uh, way forward on that uh, of, of of conserving the whole thing as a sensitive zone or 30% and is is there a resistance from the local communities itself and so how do we balance that very good question uh, yes i think um, uh, i'm aware of the gadgil and the kasturi rangan uh, reports uh, there was a section of communities that protested against the entire zone being converted into an eco zone because it comes then with the restrictions and there are communities that live off or within forest areas and so their concerns were not adequately addressed um, so sometimes what happens is there is this blanket kind of approach to things uh, do create more of a mess than actually solving a problem um Uh, also when we work there uh, we were part of that uh, understanding to gain with the communities to document what their challenges are or would be if everything would be converted into an eco zone so and how do you address that so there needs to be a kind of a road map uh, laid out very clearly as to what happens in terms of alternate livelihoods what happens in terms of other uh, the ecosystem services that are provisioned through the for these communities living around those areas how is that going to be addressed or uh, fulfilled by the government um uh, i think the human uh, animal conflict uh, the encroachment into each other spaces these are like very extremely complicated and highly uh, what do you say localized uh, issues so uh, perhaps a few stakeholder consultations public hearings etc would help to evolve a kind of consensus around it um i know that the communities initially protested the aganashini river <coughs> aganashini forest to be declared as the ltm reserve but then subsequently they themselves began became the biggest protectors mm. so you know the the, the the process of consultation is perhaps Uh, needed and what could be missing anything you want to add to that pranay you got okay all right any final questions i think uh, we are on time uh, we had it till 1 o'clock obviously pranay and aruna will be sticking around for some more time and you can sneak through the list of uh, impactful projects uh, aruna is working on but uh, um, with this i we will come to an end to this talk series at the beginning when we were putting this together we were in sure what the agenda would be but all i knew is uh, we met uh, as soon as we initiated mycelium ecology the first two people we spoke to was pranay and aruna so we were very clear we wanted to get them here and we said we'll get them here and then we'll make a story out of it let's see what we can get them to talk but i think over the last 3 to 4 uh, weeks of discussing and talking uh it's almost been a revelation and as a new day comes in we're like oh we should be talking about this oh we should be talking about it but it's all come together so i, I want to take a moment to thank pranay and aruna for joining us pranay for flying in all the way from delhi um and uh, you know if you ever thank you 
and i had uh, dinner with uh, pranay yesterday and the first thing we left the hotel room i mean the hotel uh, lobby and then he pauses and he's like hold on you're stepping into a jurassic period tile let's look at it and i'm like wow now i know why pranay is so good at it he explained what was it you uh, there was a yellow stone yeah, it's a abu limestone yeah. that's one of the stones that is getting extinct because it's a beautiful yellow uh, sandstone uh, and it's got uh, beaut- you know amazing marine life in it so if you look at it very closely you would see cross sections of bivalves and gastropods and mm-hmm. it's entirely shallow marine uh, sandstone it's very very pretty i would have never imagined i've walked over it 100 times and i would have never imagined it yeah. but this is the beauty of building mycelium so thank you pranay and aruna i'd like to thank nsr cell and iimb for supporting us initially the initial event was supposed to be at iimb we had this whole walk of uh, the ecological habitat of it but you know it's coming this is a community which will come back together again and again and we'll do it bic for providing such a wonderful space for giving us the foyer for the art gallery um you the audience members could have slept through this beautiful cold bangalore weather but you were all here some of you early on to support us so we really thank you and we hope to see you again and again uh, and then finally to the core team at mycelium uh we pulled it off and i think this is the beginning of what we believe is going to be uh, for the future so i really want to thank everybody and uh, please stick around check out all the flora fauna and my hope is in about 5 to 10 years we say flora fauna and fungi that's the idea we've only said flora and fauna but our mission is to see if we can do it but thank you have a lovely weekend everybody thank you